and gentlemen, please put your hands together for our first storyteller of the evening, Sarah Young. In August of 2005, my husband and I had the chance of a lifetime to take a trip to Alaska for two weeks. That was just no holds barred, no expenses, too much. We flew first class. We had a cabin, uh, we had a balcony cabin in, on the cruise ship. And when we found out that it was available, we paid the extra money to get the corner handicap accessible cabin because the rooms were larger and we wanted to splurge. This included taking an incredible and ultimately life-changing excursion to take a helicopter ride to land on a glacier and walk around. At the takeoff point were all the people, the helicopters, the pilots, and a small office. The organizers announced, we know we asked you to put your weight down on your registration forms, but we also know there is not one person here that is going to weigh themselves at home with all their clothes on. And everybody lies. He laughed. <laughs> so we need to get your Alaska weight so we can put you into the helicopters correctly. One at a time, we went into the office to get on the scale. And it was private. Just me, the guy getting everybody's weight, and that scale flashing angry red numbers. <laughs> and in my mind, screaming at me, 310, 310, 310. And yes, I had all my clothes in my hiking boots on, but I had no idea, none. And this was after losing 50 pounds of the weight loss program. Stunned, I walked back outside. I watched as they loaded a couple people into the front seats of the helicopters and two or three people into the back seats, and then it was our turn. And I was told quietly, but very firmly, sit in the back by yourself, in the middle, don't move. Do you understand? Oh, I understood, all right. I understood they thought I weighed as much as three people. How had this happened? I hadn't had any fast food for years at this point. I didn't stress eat. If I'm stressed, I don't eat. And I followed the, the protocol that they gave me when I left the weight loss program. But who else other than myself could I blame for this betrayal? Because to be honest with you guys, we had to fly first class because I no longer fit in coach. And we had to upgrade to that handicap capable uh, cabin because I would not have fit into the bathroom of a regular cabin. This was my come to God moment. I was 39, morbidly obese, a badly controlled type one diabetic. And even when I was smiling, I was always sad. And I knew if I didn't make changes, I was going to die. In the spring of 1978, the week before Easter, I was a perfectly normal, healthy 12-year-old. And then I got sick with severe flu-like symptoms, and my mom made an appointment for me with my doctor. I never made it to that appointment. As we were driving to the doctor's office, I looked at my mom in the car and asked her, who are you? Where are you taking me? Where is my mom? At that point, she took me right to the hospital. At the hospital, I heard the staff asking her if I had any ongoing medical issues that they should know about. And she said, no, none. But she's had the flu for a couple days, and she's lost a lot of weight. The hospital, seeing that I was severely dehydrated, and nothing in my records other than the flu put me on a standard glucose IV, which is sugar and water. That IV sent me right into a coma. When I woke up the next day, I didn't recognize the room I was in. 
but I saw my dad sitting in the corner, and I asked him where I was. Good morning, kiddo. You're in the hospital. And I remember I wasn't frightened by his answer, but I was really confused. And I asked the only thing that made sense to me. Am I going to die? And my big, strong dad took my hand, started to cry, and said, not until you clean your room. <laughs> Later that day, the hospital told me and my family that I was now a type 1 diabetic and would be on insulin injections for the rest of my life. The day before, when they had given me that glucose IV, it made me go from really bad to incredibly worse, and they tested my sugar levels. And rather than coming back a normal in the mid-90s, I was 10 times higher at 986 because overnight I had become diabetic. Being diabetic is like my immune system becoming a general that has lost his mind and he's sending his own troops to attack their base. Only with me, it's my immune system sending my antibodies to attack my pancreas and stop it from making any insulin. Literally, my body has turned on itself. And I've realized that being a type 1 diabetic is a constant, exhausting, 24-7, high-wire balancing act. If I take too little insulin and I eat too much food, I'm easily facing another coma. But if I take too much insulin and don't eat enough, or if I'm unexpectedly you know, active, my sugar's going to drop. And low sugar attacks can be as fatal as my sugar being too high. And this was just the first time that I was betrayed both by a doctor and from my own body. Later that same summer, I broke my thumb playing softball. And while we were at the hospital waiting for my x-rays to be developed, we were told to my mom and I to get dinner. Only I can't eat without taking my insulin and I didn't have it with me. So I told the nurse I needed 13 units. She gave me my injection and we went to the cafeteria. Back in the room after dinner, waiting for my thumb to be set, the nurse put my chart down next to me and stepped out of the room. So I was reading my chart because I'm nosy, and I saw where I had asked for 13 units, my chart said 53 units. And if this was right, that was more insulin than I took in two days combined. I showed my mom and we didn't know what to think. When the nurse came back, we asked her and everybody at the hospital went on high alert because she had in fact injected me with the 53 units. And I was so tired that night that if I had not accidentally seen my chart, I would have gone home, gone to sleep, and never woken up and I would have died from complications to a broken thumb. This taught me self-reliance and self-advocacy. It was the last time I let any doctor, nurse, somebody in the medical profession fill an insulin syringe for me. I can't give control of my body and my life over to anybody else. In 1984, when I was in college, I thought I had this balancing act down cold. Did I want that piece of pizza or that slice of Sanders bumpy cake? Of course I did, who wouldn't? Did I want to drink the football players under the table and win bar bets? You betcha. I figured out that if I took enough insulin, my sugar didn't go up and I didn't get drunk. Insulin was my secret weapon and I abused my knowledge. It was a horribly slippery slope I had myself on. More insulin, more food. More food, more insulin. And ultimately, more weight. This betrayal was all mine. The summer of 1990, um, a few months before I got married, my doctor said to me, Sarah, I'm switching out what kind of insulin you're on. 
And I said, why are we doing this? And my doctor said, because it's better. And he was my doctor, and I trusted him. While I was on this new insulin, my sugar control became erratic. I would drop suddenly with no warning, and I no longer felt myself going low. By the time I realized what was happening, I was incapable of asking anyone for the help that I desperately needed. The words would be clear in my mind, but they were garbled and twisted when I tried to talk them, and the harder I tried, the worse it got. Frustrated, I became angry and combative. My husband told me that if I woke up in the morning and my sugar was already low, I wouldn't even recognize who he was. These were complete blackouts. And it took a couple days each time for me to recover from these attacks, and I almost lost my job. We even had, I even had one of these attacks the day after our wedding, and we missed our honeymoon. I would see my doctor after each of these attacks, but him and his lab could never find out why I was so sick. It took my husband eventually just going, Sarah, didn't all of this start after your insulin was changed for that light bulb to go off. I was so excited. I felt in my gut that this is the answer and I called my doctor and I said, I'm allergic to this new insulin. And my doctor said, that's not even possible, Sarah. There's nothing to discuss. That made me find a new doctor. And then together, we found an endocrinologist for me, a doctor that specializes in diabetes. And working together with them, uh, I was able to go to a new insulin that was actually better for me. Another betrayal. And this one, I learned to absolutely trust what my body was telling me. Six years later, I was at a baby shower. And I was standing next to a friend that was also six to seven months along in her pregnancy. And shower guests would come up to us, and they wouldn't know which one of us was pregnant. My friend was ecstatic that nobody could tell. And I was devastated that nobody could tell. And five years after that, my mom came up to me one day and quietly said, Sarah, your weight is scaring me. Please, honey, I don't want to lose you. You have to talk to somebody. And she suggested I talk to the same people that my younger brother had used for his weight loss with good success and felt that they'd be able to help me through with it because I had special needs with being diabetic. And I think I shrugged my shoulders at her and mumbled something to appease her, but I wasn't ready to hear this, and I was very firmly in denial. A month later, my sugar dropped dangerously low one night. And I was so low that my husband couldn't wake me up. And I was so heavy, he couldn't move me. And he had to call EMS, and it took three grown men to roll me onto my back so they could get glucose gel down my throat to revive me. This was complete humiliation. This was rock bottom. But this did finally scare me enough to contact Beaumont about their weight loss program. And my mom is always right. Uh, they were able to help me, and I lost my first 50 pounds. And this brings us back to 2005 and that life-changing uh, Alaska trip. After Alaska, I knew I had to make changes, and I took control of my life and my body and joined a gym when we got home. I would look at the other people in the gym, and I would say to myself, one day I will be someone who inspires other people. And to keep myself motivated, I gave myself little tiny goals of I just had to be a little bit better today than I was yesterday. And I just have to be a little bit better tomorrow than I was today. And that got the ball of change rolling, and I lost another 90 pounds. Yeah. 
In 2008, I hit a plateau with my weight loss, and I hit it hard. I was stuck for two years until 2010 when I found one of the very first low-carb diets. And this made sense to me. And following this program, I lost weight, my overall health got better, my diabetes got under control. But rather than encouraging me, my endocrinologist says, Sarah, you cannot continue this diet. You're not even eating enough carbs to support proper brain function. But I felt so much better, and my thinking was clearer, and I was still losing weight. So I listened to my body, and even though it, my doctors disagreed with me, I stayed on this new uncharted path and lost another 100 pounds. <laughs> and in 2013, with my inner betrayals firmly in check, and I started to see victories. The first time I realized I wasn't anxious about being seated in a booth at a restaurant, and I actually had to lean forward to be close enough at the table. The first time I could fly comfortably in coach and not only fasten that seatbelt, but actually tighten it. The first summer, I didn't have to stand at a barbecue because all the furniture was plastic and I knew I far exceeded the weight tolerance on the furniture. And in 2015, I was in my garage, uh, cleaning it up, trying to, hoping that I'd be able to park my car inside of it. And, and those that know of you uh, know I'm still hoping. <laughs> and at the bottom of a box, I found a belt. This is a belt that I got when I was 12, that first rough summer of being diabetic. And it has huge significance to me. And standing in my garage, not letting myself overthink what I was doing, I enrolled that belt. I wrapped it around me. I fastened it and started to cry because it felt like coming home. And tonight, standing in front of all of you, from 12 years young, for 12 years old to 53 years young, with complete trust in myself and my body, tight control over my diabetes, having lost over 200 pounds, I know that I want to reach out to others that may be struggling and help them find their own way through their tangled paths to find their inner strength that I know is there. And what I've realized most is that at the end, what I found is myself. Thank you. Sarah Young, ladies and gentlemen.